there's two key things that stop people from moving forward and it stops them for months, years, even decades. Mm -hmm. So the first one is I don't have an idea. <clears throat> oh, you don't have an idea? So wh what does that mean? You're just gonna wait for an idea to fall down from the sky? Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't, have an, I don't have an idea either. You find an idea and you search out for it and you generate hundreds of ideas and then you slice and dice them and test them. So that's number one, the idea that you, and a lack of idea is stopping you. That should never be the case. There are ways to generate ideas and then test them for profitability. That's what we talk about on our site. Um, the second thing is I don't have any time. Please give me a break. You don't have any time? <laughs> yes, you do. So it's almost like if you say I don't have time, that's a politically correct way to say this is not a priority. Mm. Because no one can ever disagree with you and say, hey, you actually have time. It's sort of very politically incorrect yeah. to say. But if, you, if somebody says, I don't have time, like, yeah, I'm really busy too, man. So don't say that. When you start using phrases to describe yourself in a negative way, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Mm -hmm. So like I used to say, I'm just a skinny Indian guy. I used mm. to weigh 50 pounds, I was very skinny, I was 50 pounds skinnier than I am now. And I was like, I'm just a skinny Indian guy, I can't put on any muscle. Wrong, I just wasn't eating enough and I wasn't working out. But because I said that, it became part of my identity. So when you say, I don't have time, I'm so busy, I, or the worst, I'm overwhelmed, then you become overwhelmed. Yeah. So if you fix those two things, know that you can find not just one idea, you can find hundreds of ideas. And the second thing is, you do have time. The world is under your control, the world does not control you. If you change those two things, you are very likely to succeed. I was giving a talk and I asked somebody what, what they love spending on and she said, clothes. She said she loves buying clothes. I said, great, and she was so excited. I love just, whenever you ask people, their eyes light up. And I asked her, what would it look like uh, if you quadrupled your spending? And she said, I would have clothes everywhere. Like all day long, I'd be ordering online, I'd be sending half of them back. And I said, where do you shop? And she said, Top Shop. And I said, okay, so you quadrupled your spending, where would you shop? She said, Top Shop, I just have a lot more. And it was fascinating because when you ask people what they love spending on and what, if they could spend more, what would they do? Most people have never thought about it. She had limited herself into the box of Top Shop. Now, I don't know, Top Shop's perfectly fine, that's fine. But I guarantee you, if you quadrupled or 10X your spending on the thing you love, your money dial, you might shop at a different brand. You might even fly to the factory that makes them and get a behind the scenes tour, as I did when we went on our honeymoon. So wh wh why I'm sharing this is that so many of us operate in a linear way. Oh, if I have this thing I like, I like coffee, I might get two coffees a day. But what if you actually truly love it? You might go to the coffee factory and bring your family with you. So there's this whole idea of what you can do with a rich life, and it doesn't just mean more stuff. It could be experiences, it could be security, like buying a house in a place that keeps you safe or staying in a hotel where you're around things that are comfortable for you. There's so many different ways to look at a rich life and most people, I wanna challenge them to really think what it would feel like to spend more on the thing they love. Of course, if they cut costs mercilessly on the things they don't. I liken my journey with money to the journey that I took with fitness. Um, about 10 years ago, I decided to get into, get more fit and I started with a very simple reason, which was pure vanity. I was like, I wanna look like that. And I think vanity can be a good reason to get started with something. But I think if any of us have done something that we got good at, whether it be an instrument or programming or a different language, you might start for one reason. What I found is that I ended up falling in love with the craft and the discipline to go every single day and to know that, yeah, you might look a certain way, but that's actually a byproduct of all the work that you've put in every single day and perfecting that craft. Same with money. Whereas I used to, go after money, now I realize that money's the byproduct of doing all the right things. And I actually remember this as recently as six months ago. We we're on our honeymoon and I love hotels. I keep a list of hotels that I wanna go to and like I love them. And I remember we were staying at the, the last place on our honeymoon and we were already happy because we're on our honeymoon and just having the time of our lives. But I remember being even more happy because I was at this dream hotel that I'd been wanting to stay at for years. And I was trying to figure out why am I so happy, even happier than the baseline. 
And what I realized was being able to be there with my wife, but also be able to be there and not have to worry about, can we afford this? Or can we order uh, room service? That meant that I had done all the right things for years. I'd showed up at work, I got a team, which is an amazingly talented team, we made the right decisions, we recovered when we made the wrong ones, and now this is the payoff. This is one of the rewards of our rich life. What about online launch, your first launch, or your first uh, product maybe? What do you see, what are some big red flags people need to look out for? One is discounting. <clears throat> so if you truly built a product that's amazing, why on earth would you discount it 50%? It makes no sense. Wow. Second, people trying to create their first product that's a thousand or two thousand dollars, big mistake. We recommend our zero to launch students start at a fifty dollar product. Hmm. Why? Because you learn certain things at fifty dollars, at five hundred dollars, at a thousand dollars. You learn certain things about what needs to happen in a launch, what kind of pricing psychology you're going to encounter, what type of customers are you going to get. You will learn that at fifty, but it's different at five hundred. Mm -hmm. And so we want our students to go methodically up the value chain. That's how we went from a $4.95 product to like $12,000. Yeah. We didn't just jump from A to Z. You're the CEO of your business. You decide, if you wanna run a McDonald's type of business, awesome, McDonald's is an amazing company. If you wanna run a Louis Vuitton style type of business where you're focusing on select customers, you can do that as well. Don't ever let anyone pressure you into one decision. You are the CEO and you decide. Really fast define a rich life for people because I think that's going to be a key component to yeah. this whole discussion. Well, it's different for everyone. My rich life early on was to be able to go to a restaurant and order appetizers because I never did it when I was <laughs> I a kid. It. Like ever. We, we would go and we'd eat out once every four to six weeks if we had a coupon and we would like share two Cokes with the whole family and we would never order appetizers. So I was like, I'm going to do it. And then the next dream for me was to be able to hop in a taxi if I lived in New York during the summer without having to take the train and sweat before a meeting. Now my dreams got bigger and it, there's a variety of things that are my rich life, but everybody's is different. So some people, I have people in my book, they're like, I use your book, my wife and I retired at 35 and 36, we drive around in an RV. I don't want to drive around in an RV, but he and his wife do and I love that. So a rich life is what you define and when I ask people what's a rich life to you, they usually say two things. Freedom, which is a very nice word, but it's kind of generic, and they say a number, usually a million bucks. And I say, like, freedom, what is, what is that to you? And they're like, I wanna do whatever I want when I want. And I'm like, get specific. Do you wanna order appetizers? Do you wanna do yoga at 3 p.m.? And that's where the conversation stops. So if you're watching, I want everyone to think, what is your rich life? And take it from the clouds to the street. I want to buy three different Lululemon tank tops a month because I don't ever wanna to have to wear an old one. Whatever, go as crazy as you want. I wanna travel for a month and I wanna bring my family with me. Great. Uh, a rich life is different for everyone, but is about your definition. In my own life, there are several things I just don't care about. Um, don't have a TV. I use a MacBook Air that's seven years old. <laughs> I know, like, I should probably work off a dual monitor setup, but I just don't care. <laughs> And I've lived in the same apartment for 10 years and I've rented and I know the society tells you that renting is throwing money away. That's not true. Um, these are things that I just don't care about. But on the other hand, convenience, I'll spend essentially anything. Hotels, I will spend essentially anything. And there's a few other examples. My wife and I together, we're coming up with our own money dials. Relationships is a big one for us. So I would encourage everyone to really take this concept and think about it. And don't stay at the surface level. You're, if it's fitness like yours, great. Really think about what that looks like. Another woman in DC, she was into fitness too. And I said, what would your life look like if you quadruple it? She's like, I would be shredded. I was like, love it. Think big. Don't talk yourself out of it. So that is what I've learned about money dials. I see tons of entrepreneurs, they have all, their design is amazing. They have the best headshots, <laughs> they get the coolest funnels. They just forgot one thing. They forgot to build something that people actually want. And so you can have the best photography, but if you are not solving a true problem that people are saying, take my money, please take it, <laughs> then no amount of art is gonna help you. I started off with a lot of self-study. I went to 
watch at that time the Today Show, or tonight, uh, sorry, Tonight Show, it had a ton of celebrities. And if you watch celebrities, they are the absolute best in the world at public speaking. Watch them. Notice their mannerisms. Notice their tonality. Notice their body language when they're telling a story like this versus when they're telling a story like this. And so I started watching. And that was the first part. The second part was I got lots and lots of practice. Public speaking is one of those things you can't learn it just by reading a book or even watching YouTube videos. You gotta get out there. So if you don't have opportunities to do it like presentations in class or uh, you know, you're speaking on panels or something, where else can you do it? Who else knows? Where else could you find opportunities to practice your public speaking? Toastmasters, awesome. You can create a book club or join some kind of organization where you have to go around and talk about something. Find a way. And then finally, when I got more intermediate, I started getting more formal training. I did a, a media training group in New York. I hired a speech coach for my Forefront Chicago speech, which was my best speech ever. And that was because I had reached the limits of my speaking ability, so I hired a coach. Um, so that was my trajectory, but I think the key thing is there, number one, you can start with some self-teaching. Uh, number two, you need practice. You need to take a lot of swings. And then if you get more intermediate or advanced, you can hire coaches and things like that. I also think that there are other money lenses, other ways to look at the world. We heard uh, in the back uh, from the woman who said that she loves to spend on convenience, which is my money dial. Feel safe, feel relief, feel luxury and fortunate. Safety is something that we all kind of intuitively get when it's for someone else. Oh, we'll spend extra so that our kids are safe? Never gonna question that. But when it comes to our own spending, we put back that frugality lens so much of the time. It's been drilled into us by society. There are other money lenses. There are, there's the result, uh, the money lens of results. I could get a workout on YouTube, or I can pay a personal trainer for better and faster results. There's pure, there's experience. Why do you think people go to a really nice restaurant, right? Five plus courses, the experience. Um, there's pure luxury. This sweater is not gonna last 10 times more longer than that sweater, but you just want it. And so sometimes we need to, I think of it almost like a musician. You wanna have the note of frugality, but you don't wanna be a one note player. Sometimes frugality is the perfect note, but sometimes there are other notes you wanna put in. Security, luxury, results, whatever the, your money lens is. I don't want anyone in this room and anyone watching to be a one note player. There are different notes to use at different times.